do, 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 do. Hey, welcome to a special edition of the Backyard Professor Live. I have a wonderful guest on today. I'm going to give you, my beloved audience, their Christmas gift early. We've got Colby Townsend in the house. So let's get this show on the road and we will have a wonderful discussion on Enoch. Okay, welcome everybody to a special Thursday edition noon. Hey, Radio Free Mormon, my man, how you doing, brother? Kyler DeCoopman, good to see you. A holy epic intro. Well, thank you. That's pretty grandiose, all right. I have something way better than that intro. I have the soon-to-be Dr. Colby Townsend. Let's bring Colby on and say hi. How are you doing, my friend? Good. Thank you for having me on. And if uh, soon to be, you mean maybe four to five years or so, then yes. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. It's all good. You're in the tunnel, moving toward the light at the end of the tunnel. So this yep. is good. Now, you have uh, so many wonderful, uh, what do I say? You you have clout already. Um you have two bachelors, if I'm correct, and two masters, if I'm correct. Yes. Correct. Yep. Yep. W what are those in? Hmm. Yeah, my um, undergrad degrees were at the University of Utah in comparative literature and religious studies. Um, I was in the honors college there, so I was able to write um, honors theses for both. Um, one on our topic today, one on the use of scripture in First Enoch 1 through 36, and then the other on um, the influence of Genesis two through four on the writing of the Book of Mormon. Um, so yeah, those two. And then I did a master's in history with an emphasis in religious studies at Utah State University. And then here at IU Bloomington, where I'm at now as a dual PhD student in English and religious studies, um, they require a master's in English to get the PhD in English. So I just received uh, an, uh, a master's in English this last year. So good on you. Good on you. So you are almost what I would indicate as ambitious. <laughs> That's awesome. You, uh, you did your bachelor's on the uh, book of Enoch. I did my bachelor's on the teacher of righteousness in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but that was mm -hmm. way back in hoary antiquity in 1995. Right. Yeah. And I, I didn't get beyond my bachelor's, but uh, yeah. So, so we have a similar interest in some mm -hmm. some ancient stuff, and we also have a similar interest in the. Now, now your your area of expertise, though, is uh, I don't want to say just Joseph Smith's life. You go before Joseph Smith. Where do you study? Where's your yeah. emphasis? My. Um, my like current training and trajectory in, you know, the English and religious studies department here is that I study religion and literature of the long 18th century. So that means from about 1660 to 1830 or so. So Joseph Smith, like really early, you know, Mormon stuff um, is, is, is what I do. I don't really do later things. I don't, you know, I might eventually do a little bit more with, um, you know, his, his work in the late 1830s and 1840s, but I've, I've pretty much stuck to, you know, the, the 
his from his his birth, you know, up up until about 1832, 1833, maybe at this point. Um, that's been my my area of focus with him. Um, but yeah, my training is really broader than than just Mormon studies. Um, I, I look at you know primarily English literature, um, although I do some with um, continental um, literature as well, German and French. Um, but yeah, those are that's 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 my main area. So. Um, do a lot in the romantic period, um, a, the age of revolutions, um, and, you know, the development of the novel in the 18th century, uh, Gothic literature is one of my big loves. I love studying the development of Gothic literature. Um, so yeah, lots of different kinds of things, but religion and literature is sort of the, the intersection there for me. Nice. Well, I love the Gothic architecture, if nothing else. And I yeah. have read a little bit of Edgar Allan Poe, so there is that. But right. yeah, the Romantics just recently, and, and I know this is embarrassing for me to say, but I just discovered Ralph Waldo Emerson and mm -hmm. Henry David Thoreau. And I, and I know I did have a class on it back when I was in college in 94. Uh, back then, I was kind of going through a divorce and actually going to college to hide so to speak so my, my head wasn't really into it but uh, uh -huh. yeah no you have you are in a phenomenal era for really fabulous literature so i yeah we have a lot to look forward from your mighty pen young man we expect to see boatloads stacks of books <laughs> and articles. you've already produced stacks you you do a lot of book reviews i've been looking mm -hmm. at your uh, Curricula Vita, is that how you pronounce that? Curricula Vita? Uh, curriculum Vitae, I think. Vitae? Usually, yeah, usually. I, 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 that's how I've usually heard it, at least. I don't know I'm Latin. I'm trying but. to sound like a scholar, but I'm a nincompoop, but it's all No, 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 no. No, you're not. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was looking at it, and you mm -hmm. really do. Uh, what I love I loved discovering scholars mm -hmm. who also like to do book reviews. Yeah. And and so you've done quite a bit, and and your mm -hmm. fairly your range is really nice and all. So, mm -hmm. so and we'll get into that uh, yeah. a little later. So sure. I'm going to hi to folks. Uh, looks like Tim Rathbone is here, Radio Free Mormon. Oh, Colby Clout, yeah, baby, that's our good friend, <laughs> Radio Free Mormon. Yeah, Mo C, a good to see you, <laughs> Kyler DeCoopman and Heather Reddick. Nice to see you. Just say CV. You're, you're right. Yes. Yes, it is easy. That's yeah. the way to do it. There you yeah. go. Okay. Yeah, it's freezing to Heather. It's 22 below. Oh, right wow. Right Where now. you're at? Wow. Yeah, with the with the wind chill. It's the wind chill. So, yeah, okay. Yowza. I'm grateful we're doing this inside. You'd be hearing my teeth chatter. So, hey, right. Moonman55, good to see you. Okay. Now, um, I just recently met you, basically. Um, yep. Oh, a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I've been looking at your academic.edu. By the way, you guys, if you can go to academic.edu, uh, look up Kobe. Uh, he's got some fantastic papers, and he has edited some good materials and all. But your, your range of interests is really nice. I like it a lot. But the one that truly caught my eye because of my background as being a former mm -hmm. student of Hugh Nibley from a distance, and I know you're not anti-apologetic with this, your interest is in the, let's just look at the, the history, the situation, okay. and sometimes it comes out good for some groups sometimes it does not but you have some new information on the book of enoch in america mm -hmm. that i want to talk about because you are like a bloodhound you sniff out stuff that i never even knew existed i was just page after page of reading your material on enoch i'm going how did he find that out where did he get that from and so so this is always fascinating to me to find someone who uh out researches even my own former heroes so why did you pick the subject of enoch yeah For um no, that, that's a that's a good question. I mean, uh, as an undergrad, I was really mostly focused on Hebrew Bible and early Judaism. Um, that was what I was planning on going into. Um, <clears throat> I even um, 
I, I, when I originally applied to grad schools, I applied to Hebrew Bible programs. Um, so Dead Sea Scrolls was my focus that, um, thesis, um, on, you know, Genesis two through four in the writing of the book of Mormon. Um, that was supposed to just sort of be a lifting off point because I took all the, you know, the Mormon studies classes that I could as an undergrad, but I was really just planning, you know, if you, if you read that, it's more from a biblical studies perspective than it is from like a Mormon studies perspective, um, in, in, in that, in that, um, uh, that thesis. But, um, so yeah, I, I got accepted to like Yale and Chicago and Duke and university of Minnesota, university of Minnesota had, um, really good funding. <laughs> they offered me a lot of money and not coming from an academic background. Um, I knew that that was a safer bet. So, um, I started a, um, master's in religions and antiquity there. Um, and, um, unfortunately wasn't able to stay. I had family things come up. Um, so um, I had to head back uh, to Utah um, to help out with, with some things. But when I was there, I decided, you know, waiting maybe two or three years to start a master's wasn't ideal. And so I decided to do the master's in history at Utah State University. Um, so that worked out really nicely. And then that shifted my attention to uh, religion in early America and, you know, the kind of work that I had done on Joseph Smith. I could then look at um, lots of other early Americans. Um, so that was what I did um, for, for that. My master's thesis um, is um, rewriting in, uh, Eden with the Book of Mormon. So it's sort of an extension of that earlier undergraduate thesis. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, just a little bit, you know, shifting ar around in that way. The, the core for the, the essay that you are, are talking about on, on the Book of Enoch was actually a small chunk that um that was originally in my master's thesis it was the only oh. thing that my committee said hey this doesn't really fit it's super interesting um but yeah it doesn't really fit so take that out <laughs> um oh, committee so. you know what do you do with those guys <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah i mean i was lucky too my my committee was incredible um uh, philip barlow carrie holt and norm jones just incredible scholars um carrie wow. was great because she was the first to sort of she's in the English department. She, so she was my outside reader and she was the first, um, you know, professor that made me kind of think like, maybe I should be in an English department. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but yeah, it, it was a great experience and they, it was, it was totally right. Uh, what they said. And so I didn't get accepted into any, uh, PhD programs. My first round, um, I, I applied to just history and one or two religious studies programs. And so I was working as an admin assistant in pediatrics at the university of Utah. And um, I just sort of dug in and took that little, you know, the, what was originally a core. It was basically just what I had found about there not being an 1828 um, um, uh, printing. And we could talk about that more. Um, uh, but I had found that out. And so I sort of had that little piece of the, the essay in there. And then um, from the end of spring 2019, I think I had I had quite a few um, little pieces already. I was really interested in the claim, particularly from Nibley, his, his essay, um, you know, arguing that no one was interested in um, uh, the Book of Enoch um, in, you know, the early 19th century. And I was like, really? Because I'm, I'm finding a lot of stuff <laughs> that, you know, that it was there. Like I knew about the 1715. Now, now, hey, I, I just, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I just want to use this as yeah. a real good comparison contrast of the difference between a scholar him, <laughs> him, and the apologist. Because when I read Nibley, mm -hmm. and and I still have the book, the Who Doesn't oh, yeah. Write Enoch the Prophet. That mm -hmm. was his group of Ensign articles. I just absorbed everything Nibley said and accepted it. Yeah. I, I I didn't even think of looking outside. I said, "Wow, you yeah. know, Nibley says this, and he says that, and all that." So right, right. So you instead dug in and said, "All right, let's take a look." Yeah. And I did the same thing with Quinn, um, you know, Quinn's second edition. I think he added something like 60 pages to that, you know, or something, something crazy. A lot of, a lot of pages to that chapter. And um, he said, you know, that, oh, well, the New York public, not the New York, what is it? The, it was, it was in the New York public library, but he didn't say that the yeah. uh, national union catalog of pre 1956 imprints. It's the longest name, but um, it's basically a, you know, a, a pre internet world cat in print volume. It was like 900 volumes. And yeah. um, the Library of Congress had created those. So he found um, a reference to an 1828 in, in that catalog. 
And he said, yeah, I mean, it's in there. Nibley didn't have this when he was writing, so he couldn't have known. But yeah, there is, you know, this edition. And my mind said, great. I need scans of it. I need to, I need to see the edition. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah. So I reached out to the New York Public Library. Well, I, I found it, at least. I found the National Union catalog, looked it up, realized, okay, the only um, edition that they have is at the New York Public Library. There's no, it's nowhere else. And so I reached out to them. I was already looking on their catalog, couldn't find it, asked them if they could help me. I found a catalog of uh, uh, Ethiopic and Amharic, like classical Ge'ez uh, manuscripts and documents um, from the 1920s or 30s. And it wasn't in there. Um, so um, they got back to me and said, yeah, we don't have any record of ever having that. And then that catalog that you pointed out from the 20s or 30s, yeah, it's not in there either. And I was like, you know, so Quinn made a mistake. Quinn didn't. Oh. Uh, that's the interesting thing. But the only, like, if you were to say that Quinn made a mistake, it would only be that he didn't go to the New York Public Library and ask them <laughs> to see it. I guess oh, you know, okay, okay. Um, like you could say that. I guess, but okay. um, I mean, he he was right. The new the the National Union catalog said that there was an eighteen twenty eight. Yeah, you could look in it still. You know, it's, it's there. It's never going to change. But. Um, but I, what I, what, what, with what I did, I compared the catalog of the he, the, the, um, sorry, Amharic and classical Ge'ez texts. I, ca I compared that because um, that had everything that they had in the New York Public Library um, with the National Union catalog, and I said, oh, over here in their own catalog from the 1920s or 30s, there are two 1838 printings of it, one in classical Ge'ez one in English. Over here, there's only one 1838 in the National Union catalog, but there is the one 1828. And the more that I learned about the process of the creation of the National Union catalog, um, I found out that um, the Library of Congress would basically send these he just thousands and thousands of these cards, just stacks of these cards, and out to libraries. And the librarians had to then go through all of their books and write on these cards Oh, what yeah, books yeah. they had, and then send those back. And so I imagined that pro uh, practice and that process, and, <laughs> you know, mid 20th century handwriting cursive. If you can, if you think of a three and you think of a two yeah. with the right handwriting, they're the exact same. And so I, my, my opinion is that whoever entered into, uh, entered that card into the system for the actual print edition saw a three and thought it was a two. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because the three would have been there. You said there was a yeah. An 1838 as well yeah. as a 1828. Yep. Oh they didn't have they didn't have two 1838s and it was all handwritten model. back then. Yeah. That oh, interesting cool. detective work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. it. See that see that's why I wanted you on the show because I, I mean half my audience already knows who you are. Your reputation precedes <laughs> yourself. But this guy is a real detective when it comes to historical analysis. So we will find that out as I have him on hundreds of times more on my show through the up and coming decades. So this is fun stuff for me. I love this. So. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, that's really like, like into the weeds, but you know, for me reading both Nibley, reading Quinn, I didn't care. Like I, I don't, the whole camps thing and sides thing I don't get. And you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm at the university. I have my own biases. Of course. I don't, I don't deny that everybody does. Sure. Um, but I, I, I think it's very unhealthy, um, for an academic. It, yeah. I, I wouldn't suggest it for anybody else anyway, but for anyone to just sort of read something and just accept at face value, what they're saying, it's always, it's, I'm not even saying, you know, um, be, sus be suspicious of everything. I'm just saying double check. <laughs> it's just a simple, just double check, you know? Um, yeah, just sure. go back into it. You know, if someone says that there's this print edition, where is it? I'd like um, to have, you know, a PDF of it. Um, see it for yourself. Yes. Yeah. The PDF of it. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, just that, that kind of thing. So it didn't matter to me if it was, you know, Nibley or Quinn or whatever. And, you know, in the end, um, as I wrote in, uh, in that part of the essay, and this is only a small part of that essay. It's just clarifying that I, sure. uh, I guess we could get to the, to the larger point of the essay in a minute, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, I just sort of said that, you know, the, the new discovery that Quinn had made uh, actually 
ended up at a dead end, <laughs> unfortunately. New discovery, right? Yeah. Right. But yeah. it was important. And, and like, that, that was fun to read, though, because yeah. what we have here, see, um, I, I think as a former apologist, I, I had this uh, hero worship complex. And anybody who knew more than me, which was literally everybody, I I just, oh, he said this, so I accepted it now. Mm -hmm. We start with naive being raised Mormon. And so, and there's no excuse. That's on me. So, so, but. We're all, so, I mean, we're all young and that, you know. It's fun to see how the detective yeah. work is done so yeah. that I can begin to practice that. And I've been doing that now for quite a while anyway. So, yeah. fun stuff. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah way to look at that mm -hmm. yeah and I, I was lucky i got to chat with quinn about this so when i was a master's student at, oh, at USU, right. he act i was assigned to actually spend a day with him um he was on campus and he needed to just have somebody with him to get to different appointments and so i got to hang out with him um that that whole day and he was um give, uh, giving a lecture they had flown him in from california and um so i just got to spend time with him and i told him about this i told him the whole story that everything i just you know told you and he laughed and he was like, that's so great. I, I didn't know what he was going to say. I was a little nervous, you know. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey, I know you're the great D. Michael Quinn, but I have yeah. corrected you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, yeah, the, you know, the paper is going to be coming out. Um, it's you know been accepted. Or I think at that. No, no. At that point. No. I said I was working on the paper because I hadn't submitted it yet. Um because I was but he was all that. good with it, huh? He was yeah, no, he was great. Yeah. And he was like, you know, this is actually exactly why I do my notes the way that I do. Because he was like, I get a lot of pushback on the way that I do my end notes and how long they are. He's like, but I want to start off laying the the, the road work for a, a road that you know you or anybody else might go down. Exactly. And then that way it's set up so that people actually go down it. And he's like, So honestly, the fact that you went down that road and you found out it was a dead end. That that's a huge honor to me. Like I, I I'm really grateful that you did that. And I was like, thank and you. That, 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 that actually, yeah. you know, we have to discover the, the dead ends as well as the highways yeah. because that is part of the research. So it's yeah. all good. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad he took that attitude instead of a, I know in the past there've been some scholars who really, uh, are mm -hmm. so stuck on themselves that they can't stand being corrected. Mm -hmm. And nobody I know, but I'm just saying that in general. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. this spirit of the scholar that Quinn evoked and, and that you're evoking with the with the research, and let's get to the bottom of this and all, mm -hmm. it is so nice for all the rest of us to see how it's done. I'm, I'm just saying thank you. Mm -hmm. It's not a thankless job, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, now, oh, my good pleasure. This, I'm having so much fun. I can't hardly see straight. <laughs> now, we, uh, I've got to confess, uh, th this paper, and if we have time, uh, mm -hmm. we may not, and it's all good because we're going to do some recordings also that I can post later. But uh, sincerely, I'll just say this out loud for my audience to look forward to something in the near future. Truly, your paper on Malachi in the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. just a delight. Oh, it was good. as delightful to me as your paper on Enoch. Mm -hmm. But then your book reviews that kind of tie into things like this. I know you've kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. You've actually reviewed the uh, Joseph Smith Papers, uh, Brian Hoglid volume on the uh, mm -hmm. the papyri. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. nice to see you reviewing some of those higher end mm -hmm. LBS productions as well. So, yeah. so yeah. this is all great stuff. So let's, you just kind of take us step by step on your one. I loved how you talked about the, uh, the discussion with, uh, who was it, Scaliger and mm -hmm. some of the other earlier scholars and and how they were approaching this Enoch stuff. I'm just go ahead and elaborate. What were you feeling when you were seeing that my gosh, there is a really actually big interest in Enoch in the mm -hmm. UK and America? That mm -hmm. had to excite you a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, um, I had a I had a group of friends that, you know, we all kind of share research notes, and um, there's just a, f a few of us. And I, I want to um, be 
clued it in on that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, we can we can chat for sure. Yeah, but, you know, you just you you have friends that you're you know you're all working on different things and you share notes and um and you know I would send them every once in a while these little notes where I was like, um, <laughs> I thought like I you know from from and it wasn't just from um, Mormon studies but from other areas. So like this essay is is in, is engaging with both Mormon studies and Blake studies about William Blake. There um, was yes, and yes, the, yes. the literature that I was reading uh, on William Blake as well was saying very similarly. Uh, there was a because guy because it who, was interesting that he was really into Enoch also. Oh yeah, yeah, he was working on. Was he, a, he didn't finish this project, but yeah, he had sketches that he was working on some sort of Enoch project. Now and, was that because was that because of his uh, academic interest, or was it because he wanted to to get that? spirit so that he could really do his spectacular art or was it a little bit of both i think for blake um it was probably I, all of those all at once all the time <laughs> um you know it all was yeah he yeah. was um you know yeah. so yeah i think i think there's that but um i don't know the the the, the enoch um texts are, are are just kind of an odd thing you know the so the the nibbly like figure in blake studies was writing in the 1970s um his last name is bentley i can't i can't think of his first name right now i'm pretty pretty sure it was bentley um but yeah he he wrote um a a book and in this one section of the book he was talking about you know when do we date these um, enoch manuscripts from william blake and he said well his argument was well we it, it has to be after 1821 because you know, Richard Lawrence's uh, Book of Enoch translation didn't, you know, Book of Enoch wasn't available until 1821. So very similar argument to what Nibley was saying. Um, I don't think either of them were reading each other, <laughs> um, no. but, it, you know, very similar argument in the same decade. And um, that's basically what Bentley's argument was, is that, you know, without Lawrence's um, uh, Enoch, you know, um, um, uh, Blake couldn't have done it. So, um, I thought that that was interesting, but then I was reading um, uh, other scholarship uh, on this problem in the 1990s in Blake studies and in the 2000s and 2010s. And there were a handful of, of, of scholars in, in Blake studies that pointed out like, you know, no, there's this, um, you know, translation of First Enoch 1 through 32 in this newspaper um, in 1805. Um, so here's one source. Blake could have read that. And, you know, that, that's that's totally pl plausible. And then um, I think that altogether by, you know, the 20, like mid 2010s, the scholarship that I was reading had about a 10 or so sources that they were pointing at and saying, here, you know, here's all of these somewhere between five and 10 sources. And so um, I said, yeah, these are great. Um, this is this is important. Obviously, if William Blake had, you know, um, had access to some of these, then Joseph Smith and others um, could have because they're not the only two. Um, Thomas More. The Love of the Angels um, is a poem. Um, I actually have a second edition um, of that book on my shelf, um, 1822, 21, something like that. Um, and you know, uh, John Flaxman and a handful of others um, were, were doing this. So it's not just Joseph Smith. It's not just William Blake. But, you know, you're, I was looking at all of these different um, characters. And then since it was for like a Mormon studies audience, I really focused more on, okay, you know, this has been a big issue um, for Mormon studies. So I think that this would work for dialogue. Um, but, um, and yeah. it, oh, and hey, incidentally, not to interrupt China, I, yeah. I, I'm rude doing this. I apologize. Oh, you're good. You're good. Who had a uh, interview with dialogue yesterday? Did you not? I did. Yep. Uh, yep. How did that go? It was great. Yeah. We talked about my recent essay. So, yeah. awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm just letting my audience know, brother, you get around. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is good. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Yes. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, yeah wonderful. So. that's wonderful that they wanted to bring you in and uh, give mm -hmm. you some exposure. You deserve every moment. You really okay. do. Your, your work you. is so enjoyable. So I don't mean to swell your already fat head, but you are wonderful. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can see it. Can hey, see it growing. On uh, this, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I love how this background kind of caught your attention, and yeah. you said, "Okay, hey, okay." Now the Blake scholars are saying he could have had that, 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 but yeah. that's the same time frame. That yeah. that means Joseph Smith could have too. I loved how you brought that out in your essay. Right. Yeah, so I, I went from something like you know five to ten sources, and I found um, altogether my collection is about eighty sources from seventeen fifteen to eighteen thirty. 
Say that again, because I was yeah. blown away when yeah. you told me that 80 sources. Yeah. And that's just a, you know, that's just a part of it. We, we don't have all of the different, you know, pieces um, of, you know, from like the printed history. Um, so there, there were probably more, but my main point in, in the essay is to, is to essentially say, um, you know, recently scholars have been focus, focusing on this 1828 in most of the publications over the last 10 or so years. Um, and, you know, dissertations or master's theses, people had focused on the 1828 without double checking. Stop focusing on that. It's a dead end. But then also stop focusing on Lawrence's translation. That wasn't the only thing. Like, that's my main invitation <laughs> to scholarship um, and in both uh, Mormon studies and Blake studies that, yes, Lawrence was like an important part of the story, but people were already doing it. People were already working on it. And the relevant section, which is really the Book of Watchers, um, the relevant section of the Book of Enoch had been in English almost the whole thing. The first 32 chapters instead of the, the full 36, the Book of Watchers. But um, that had been in English for over 100 years before um, Blake and Smith um, were working on um, their Enoch stuff. So yeah, that's kind of my main invitation <laughs> in, the, in the essay because I go through and I spend the bulk of it just describing sort of in chronological order yep. what sort of the lay of the land was, you know, from 1715 all the way up to 1800, there were, there were a few um, sources, not a ton, but there were plenty. Um, and then right at 1800, it just explodes. It, it, it just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what impressed me. I thought, wow, I, I just, you know, I had Nibley's paradigm and you brought that out and I'm going, oh, well, mm -hmm. now, stuff. Yeah. Now, now perhaps the reason, uh, we've all kind of more or less focused on Lawrence is because it's mm -hmm. such a, almost a romantic story. It, it's serendipity, the book of Enoch. This mm -hmm. guy finds it. And he, and he also discovers now, now that was the, uh, uh, that was the Ethiopian, wasn't it? But it was in the Abysmian canon of scripture. Now Nibley made a big group to do about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah, so, yeah, it was found. Um, now I can't remember his name. It was found by um, Bruce. Maybe it was uh, Richard Bruce or something. But it was found in the 18th century, um, and right. he had scribes copy it. Um, and I should say, found. It was it was part of their canon. And th this is an area where I would actually like to tease out a bit more about how, you know, why Europeans, uh, particularly in the 18th century, but even a little bit in the 17th when, when you know, people were still trying to find it. Um, oh, let's see. What did he say? Sorry. Uh, did, yeah, uh, this is Radio Free Mormon. I wanted to put this question up. Oh, yeah. we could talk did, about that in a minute. Can we hold that okay, one for a second? Okay. okay yeah, remind yeah, me, yeah. Remind me I'll just minute. leave it up there for you and yeah. you finish your thought because that's a great question from our Yeah, family. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um um, yeah, what was I saying there? Um, the, yeah, I've always tried to, cause it's not just, it's, it's one of those, like the new world wasn't discovered, right? There, there were people here, <laughs> um, uh, in the, you know, in the mid 20th century, historians were still describing, um, the, the, um, like North America as a barren wasteland. Um, when the, you know, European settlers got here, it's like, no, <laughs> that's not, that, why do we do this? But, um, it's the same thing here is that, you know, the, the, the Ethiopic Christian church had had relationships with um, the Vatican and when, and with other Europeans. So I've always been kind of curious, like that was in their canon. How did people not know that? Um, so Bruce quote unquote discovers it, um, it, uh, has a couple of scribes copy it down and he takes, I think three manuscripts, um, to, uh, Europe. And I think he gives one to like the King of France and then he keeps one for himself. I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah. He actually yeah. had three copies, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, and then I think he kept one for himself and then uh, one of them went into a British library or something. That's right. And one went yeah. into the back. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so um, that's sort of the basis of it. There was someone else that was working on a translation that I guess it just never got finished. I don't know if he passed away or what happened, but then yeah, Lawrence was the first one to do the full um, translation, but it's like 50 years, 40, some 45 years, maybe um, after Bruce brought, you know, the manuscript. So a lot of people knew about it. Bruce's travels um, in, uh, uh, in in Ethiopian uh, in that area um, were a very popular publication, went through several editions. Um, so it, yeah. it was 
FF Bruce, who also brought us the discovery of the Gnostic books of Yehu. Hmm. If I remember right, he found Enoch. Well, well, and he wow. also found the Pistis Sophia and the books of Yehu, which I have the mm -hmm. German translation of from mm -hmm. one of the Scots. But yeah, so yeah. I just wanted to throw that. Bruce was mm -hmm. an intrepid discoverer, and he brought forth mm -hmm. a lot of valuable old texts. So not mm -hmm. just the Enoch. Mm -hmm. so anyway, keep going. Sorry, I'm interrupting. Well, no, you're good. But yeah, on uh, Radio Free Mormon's question. Yeah, um, let me read it out loud so my listeners yeah. can hear if they're on the podcast. So, yeah, he asked, did other English translations of First Enoch available to Joseph Smith have a singular God who wept as in Pearl of Great Price Enoch? Uh, the, the Just straightforward answer is no. Um, the, the weeping is complicated. Um, it's complicated for several reasons. And I, I, this is an area that I've invited Mormon scholars to think a, a little bit more about it. I, I don't know if I've ruffled feathers with this, but there are two. There are two complications. Carol Givens, you need to talk to him about that because he makes I've he a whole book on this, the God who weeps. Yeah, I've chatted with him. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I've ruffled feathers though. But um, so um, first off, uh, and this is what he and I talked about. This was at a conference in 2017. Um, um, in the manuscripts of um, the Book of Moses, what becomes the Book of Moses. You have Old Testament 1, Old Testament 2, and Old Testament 3. Old Testament 1 is the first manuscript. It's only partial. It's not the full revision of Genesis. And um, so that, that's mainly from 1830. And then at the beginning of 1831, um, Smith and his group copy Old Testament 1 onto Old Testament 2 and Old Testament 3. Old Testament 3 becomes one of the Whitmer's um, sort of personal copies. So we can kind of lay that one aside for a minute. Old Testament 2 becomes the working manuscript um, for Smith's revision of the Bible. And in that one, he revises the text. And um, in one of my essays, I engage with this um, on uh, textual criticism in Mormon studies is the name of that. It's, it's in the Intermountain West Journal of Religious Studies. But um, uh, in revising that section, um, I think that this is my opinion. Um, I think that Smith realized that the pronouns in that section were really complicated and it was really confusing. It says God, Enoch, and then he, 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 like all these, you know, just yeah. masculine pronouns, singular pronouns all over the place. And um, I think that when he went back and was revising it, I, I don't know if he wanted to depersonalize it or if he, it just made more, I think it made more sense as, as he reread it. That it was Enoch weeping with the heavens, and this is a just like so many other um, co corrections and revisions in Smith's revision of the Bible. This is a the theological uh, co correction. Interesting. Yeah. He is trying to take the problem of the deluge, the the um, the flood, of God murdering everybody. He's taking it out of God's hands. And putting it into the people's hands. So I'll get to that in a second. But as he's revising this, he actually, in Old Testament 2, and God wept, is corrected. It, God gets crossed out, scratched out, and then Enoch is written over. So in the working manuscript, it's actually, and Enoch wept, and the heavens also. Um, and um, if you really think about it, in the entire Mormon canon, how many times um, does God weep? Oh, at least 17. <laughs> but can you can you actually think of any time outside of that no. and that's why this one it gets so much attention right the it, weeping it itself in the narrative actually makes more sense the way that old testament 2 revises it um from that sort of like theological perspective and mm -hmm. this is why um the the weeping the, is the flood it's the tears coming down from heaven destroying oh. the people oh so rather than having God and God's tears, you know, it's Enoch and the heavens are weeping together. Maybe you could throw in God with that. I don't know. It's, a, you know, people could read it that way. But the problem still remains. The one time that you have weeping from God or the heavens is what brings complete annihilation of everyone on earth except for one family. So yeah. that implication has never actually been brought into the discussion either. I don't do theology. I say that all the time. I don't do theology, but 
that seems like an important part of understanding that text that just never gets brought up. Um, so I, I've brought it up a handful of times and, you know, either people just sort of say, thanks for ruining things or, um, you know, <laughs> or, or kind of just don't say anything. Um, and I just, that, that's, like, yeah. the, uh, that's the double edged sort of scholarship there. You know, it's like when, uh, uh, I, I discovered the rebuttal to the fact that Jesus in the Aramaic is calling God daddy uh -huh. and everybody jumped on that. And I said, well, I got bad news for you. That's a complete misreading. Mm. And boy, I think I made a lot of enemies when I, the nice thing is the LDS scholar, Kevin Barney backed me up on that one with the, with the fair apologist. But I think mm -hmm. this God weeping is very similar to that. And, and, you know, isn't that, uh, let me ask your expertise. Isn't that basically a, a Jewish, uh, mythological motif of the heavens weep. That's what the rain is. The angels are crying, stuff like that. Somewhat. Yeah, I mean, it can be. Um, I don't really hear it very often. Um, I think it's but, in Schwartz's book, The Tree of Life, the first book yeah. on Jewish mythology, something like that. Yeah, right? like there, there are things like that. Um, I don't, I don't think that it would have been in the world of Joseph Smith. I think that what's going on in in the Book of Moses um, is just strictly that that he's trying to work through. Okay, you know, I don't like. It's very consistent all throughout his revision of the the, the Old Testament that God doesn't repent. So if it ever says that, he changes it, right? Thanks. Um, yeah, good yeah. point. And in yeah. this one, his first version of the text is God weeps, and that's what brings on the destruction of the people because of their sins. And, you know, the whole conversation between um, Enoch and God is, um, yeah, you know, like, this is a sad thing, and it's because of them. Like, they're the ones that brought, brought the tears, the the rain on themselves. It's not, you know, it's not anybody else's fault, but theirs. So, um yeah, it sort of removes um, God's responsibility um, from the destruction in the flood, and it works through that theological problem. Yeah, I just want you to see a Radio Free Mormon is saying interesting point, Colby, and it really is. That's I've never heard it explained quite this way, so this is this is wonderful. So, and you guys in the chat, if you want to ask Colby questions, please feel free to. And I will post them and he will be happy to answer them to your complete 100% satisfaction or else it's just your problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, No money back if no money exchanged. Yeah. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed to keep you coming back for more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I like this. I, I like this. Uh, the new, and again, it's like, uh, way back when when I was just cutting my teeth into reading about science when I was in high school, I read one of the Isaac Asimov quotes where he said, uh, research means to look again. And yeah, why not? You might find something you missed before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that is the perfect encapsulation of your entire paper here on Enoch is, is let's, let's take another look. And the cool thing is that you've indicated there is still more that, and now you've piqued my curiosity. I actually would like to see that Abyssinian canon uh, mm -hmm. with Enoch in it. And awesome. see, why wasn't that known? Because I mean, it's not like they were trying to hide it. Right? Yeah. You know, and it might be that, you know, it was just, you know, it's the long 18th century international relations are just kind of really starting up and, um, you know, yeah. the, 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 I mean, even if you got images of it, you wouldn't be able to tell what, what it was, meant, right? Um, because it's in, it's in classical Ethiopic, it's in Ge'ez, so, um, the Ge'ez, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, I don't know it, so, yeah, yeah, I would need a seer stone, right? Uh, speaking of which, my good yeah. friend, yeah. Colby and I will be talking about this. Uh, he told me just the other day, I went to the bookstore and I had this in my hands and put it back on the shelf. Then in a phone conversation later that day, Colby said, oh, that's one of the best books I've read on this subject. I'm going, oh my gosh. So I ran back over there and got it. Uh, so get prepared. I'm, this is for my audience, Colby. Uh, mm -hmm. Colby and I are going to have some good conversations and I'm about half a, a third of the way through the book. I just bought it a day ago. And it really is good. And, mm -hmm. and it really is a significant study mm -hmm. in, the, in an environment 
aspect yeah. in Christmas Day that is right in front of our eyes, and I've never thought of it. It's right. just a mind boggler, isn't it? Right. Well, and that and that book is so great because it's really it's not written to a Mormon studies audience. It's written to a broader audience, so it actually contributes to our understanding of early America. So, um, you know, lots of scholars in my field have really loved um, that book and been very impressed um, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's um, not it's not a it's not a Mormon book for Mormons. Yeah, at all. And 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 it is a wonderful early Americana book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it so far. Yeah. I will be finishing it by tomorrow so that you and I can do a pre-recording on it. We're, we're going to talk about that on the mm -hmm. show. So, Okay, what else uh, did we want to discuss about this Enoch? Uh, oh, you know what? Let me, real quick, this was the, uh, yeah, I actually did this in my short video earlier this morning because I was so blasted excited about this that uh, Nibley in his in his Enoch the Prophet the book uh, says the uh, on page one hundred two he said that there was a gentleman named Ludolf who who was basically uh, just skeptical of this whole book of Enoch enterprise he he just said no it's it's silly. It, it's a myth. Nobody gives a flip. Mm -hmm. And this was the uh, inroad that Nibley basically used to try to mm -hmm. demonstrate the gap of interest mm -hmm. during Joseph Smith's time. Because mm -hmm. others followed Ludolf's lead, Nibley magnifies it. He actually does a fallacy, I believe. What's the fallacy called where you take a particular and then generalize it all, all the way out? I don't do I don't do the philosophy. I, yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, I know you're talking about. Anyway, he, yeah. he basically yeah. said, as a result yeah. of Ludolf's authoritative right. contribution, all hopes of obtaining the book seem to have died away throughout Europe. Yeah, and so he was he was creating that gap of mm -hmm. interest, which you have found just did not exist. Maybe yeah. in some right. individuals, but not continent wide. Yeah, no, and you know in the. In the 17th century, uh, maybe even back to the 16th a little bit, um, you know, th there were enough references in Greek literature to the Book of Enoch. Um, in the New Testament, Jude um, has a couple of verses quoting it um, that, you know, but Christians knew about it. Christians knew that, like, this is this was a text. Um, there were some, you know, early Christian fathers that um, likewise talked about it um, and talked about the fall of the angels and, and that, you know, part just part of the story. And um, what happened was, um, I don't know exactly the year, and this is the this is where I think that you know um, would be fun to work a little bit more into this. But um, uh, the chronography of um, like George Sinkellis or something like that—I don't know how to pronounce his name—but he actually has that's that's where the translation was coming from um, into yeah, English. Yes, um, yes, I just yeah. read that this morning. So yeah, okay, yep. yeah, um, and so you know, um, I think that somewhere in the late. Um, 17th century um, was when uh, you know scholars started actually translating that into European languages from Greek. Um, it was a Greek quote of the first, basically like 32 chapters um, of the Book of Enoch, and so yeah, that's how it gets into that before um, you know the Ethiopic manuscripts are ever found. Um, but yeah, you you, you know the, the a good chunk of of that first part of the book of Enoch. Um, it, there's 108 chapters, five se different sections, and um, yeah, the the uh, book of Watchers one through 36. That was the famous one, wasn't it? Yep. The, the Watchers would. I mean, that would yeah. be that would be far more interesting uh, than the calendar. And I know it's pretty fragmentary, but in this, I was just telling you earlier before the show, I got this Nicholsburg, this great big Hermania volume on one Enoch. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the calendrical texts are much more scattered. And if you're into the theme now, of course, and I've got a dear friend, uh, Travis Overly, who I just did a, a podcast with just last week, who, who describes the importance of the Jewish calendars with the festivals mm -hmm. and reason the Dead Sea Scrolls did not like the second uh, temple generation mm -hmm. was because they had changed the calendar and that caused all kinds of havoc, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, 
Essenes just said, no, we're not even going to stick around in town. We're going to ditch out and go to the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. And it's possible that rather than changing the calendar, they just disagreed <laughs> on, uh, on the calendar too, you know, the, so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of, a lot of things that, that, that go into the politics of, of all of that, but yeah. 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 The nice thing to know is they had politics anciently, just like we do today. Oh yeah. It's, their politicians weren't as stupid as ours. Oh. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. That yeah. was really you you'd, you'd hope so. Yeah. Colby, do you have any time for hobbies is one of the questions. Oh, <laughs> hey, Noel Hausler. <laughs> Noel Hausler is the one who has uh, gotten me involved with the Egyptologist, Dr. Meckes. Thank you yeah. for showing up, Noel. Noel's a good dear friend from way back. So, yeah, we do yeah. study on papyri and hypocephali together. Good uh -huh. to see you. Glad you could show up. Yeah. And, and uh, in response to that, yes. Um, so, to a certain extent, this is my hobby. Um, my, and it is my That's training. But, no, 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 you don't get away with that, Craig. <laughs> but also, uh, every once in a while, yeah. Uh, I my, my brother lives in Utah, and so we play video games together to keep in touch. So uh, that, that's that's a good side. Uh, side hey, uh, what games do you guys like? What's uh, we, one? Play, we play a lot of different things, but lately we've played Halo quite a bit together. Um, yeah, that's a good one. That's fun. Thing, so. Yeah, that's been you fun. You ever play Skyrim? Oh yeah, yeah. I got it when it first came out. Yeah, yeah my, that's my all-time favorite one. Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic game. So it it is. Well, in that game, you really do see what the true priesthood looks like. Mm. <laughs> it's the priesthood of power. He's uh -huh. got that magic stuff and all that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, there he is. So right. he's not just talking, and it's not too sacred not to show off. He shows it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Be yeah. Beating up all those. Uh, ghouls and stuff so right. how fun how fun all right you guys do you have any more questions for colby uh i don't let's see hobbies compositional yeah it could be compositional fallacy um i do have a question for you colby i i have i have uh now, now um I've, I've got the third enoch that and they call this the Hebrew Enoch. I think this is the late copy. It, it's a, well, not just a copy. It's a late composition. Or uh, composition, I mean. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. like four, fourth to fifth century? Something like I, that. It might even be a little later. I, don't, I, I haven't done enough work on that one. I just focused on first Enoch. I did a little bit with second oh. Enoch. But second Enoch, um, there's a lot of really good stuff in the last 10 years that have, have come out. And I just haven't done as much with second Enoch. Oh, you're going to make me spend more money. <laughs> this one is considered more of the, uh, it, for lack of a better description, just off the top of my head, the more uh, spiritual one. This one has the ascension of Rabbi, uh, what's his name? Anyway, one of the famous rabbis, they're talking about the mystical ascensions to heaven in this one. Yeah. Other than the watchers and the the right. calendar and all that, so yeah. it is a later compass. I guess fourth and fifth century would be in Augustine's day, wouldn't it? Some, yeah, somewhere around there. That's how yeah. late it is. So, yeah. so this Enoch literature spreads over time. Do you recall what the earliest? Doesn't it date back to about the time of Daniel? Technically speaking, yeah. chronologically, Daniel would be the last book of the Old Testament. Right. Yeah, that's Not correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, that's right. correct. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. Uh, Malik, Malachi is an interesting one because traditionally it's dated to about 450 BCE. Scholars date it to about 450 BCE. That's like the one <laughs> that actually, you know, <laughs> fits pretty well um, in, in its period. Um, and a lot of a lot of stuff is written either around that time or after. So Malachi isn't, you know, really super late. Daniel, though, um, is the last written sometime around 165 BCE. And um, parts of the, the book of Enoch are probably actually older um, than that. Um, the oldest parts of the book of Enoch is, um, is and that's that um, first volume with Nicholsburg. Um, some of the texts in there um, are yeah. the, the are oldest the, parts. So um, are those yeah. older ones, are those older ones, some of those that were found in the, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, do you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, parts of all, well, well, I shouldn't say it that way. So there are five different parts of the book. Scholars had um, argued that it was originally written in Aramaic before we ever had Aramaic manuscripts. And oh. R.H. Charles was arguing that, you know, 110 years ago. And yeah. um, they turned out right um, with the, the discovery of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, J.T. Millick um, was the first one that, um, you know, noted, oh, okay, here's all these different fragments. These actually come from the Book of Enoch. 
they're in Aramaic. Uh, we know that that's the original uh, language now. Um, and um, um, now I'm now I'm forgetting. Now I'm losing my train of thought. Sorry. What you had said though um, about I I was asking about the age of the uh, the manuscripts. Yes. If they dated back oh, or down. Uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, four of those five sections of the Book of Enoch, um, parts of those were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the one section that goes from 37 to 70, chapters 37 to 70, um, that was argued to be the, the latest, so like the youngest composition, um, and that wasn't found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that one, uh, arguably somewhere between 50 BCE and 50 CE. Some some scholars disagree on you know when exactly, but so that one was late enough that you know it's that that section's not in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. We got another question here from our dear friend Radio Free Mormon. Did Joseph Smith work against one Enoch in Genesis by describing the sons of God taking mortal women to wife as the sons of men? And if so, why do you think he did so? Let's see. I'm trying to make sure I understand the question by describing the sons of God taking mortal women to wife as the sons of men. Oh, um, I think uh, if you read my essay, I don't really like heavily point this out. Um, but the, th there were a couple of different ways of approaching understanding the book of Enoch um, in, you know, the eight, long 18th century. So uh, particularly like, you know, from the 1780s up until 1830. Um, well, it's a long century too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so there, one of the main arguments that, that I ran into was, well, this is like a fourth century CE um, fake. It's a forgery. Um, it, you know, it's clearly trying to write, uh, you know, whoever wrote it is clearly trying to write a version that f fits Jude. Um, and it's just a, it's a fake. Um, and then, uh, they would still comment on it, though. They still had opinions on the story of, you know, the, the sons of God and the and the daughters of men. Um, and um, the um, on the flip side, the um, the way that it was be, that the book of Enoch and that whole and this story was being read at the time was um, that uh, there were no angels. None of that kind of stuff happened. There were no fallen angels. It was basically just the two bloodlines, um, Cain's and, and, Seth. and Seth. Yeah. yeah. And this is actually, this is important too. One lived down in the valley. Yeah. Exactly. And the ones up on the mountain were the, were the sons of God. And then the ones down here were the daughters of men. And, you know, they, uh, the, the sons of God um, fell um, and, uh, you know, mis because of miscegenation, literally, um, yeah. because they intermarried with a group that they weren't supposed to. And, um so that was the prevailing idea. And that's another thing that, you know, uh, I think that Nibley would say pretty often, like, holy cow, like Joseph Smith is the only one that, um, you know, would ever say, you know, that, that, that it was like this. And it's like, no, that was like, that was from what I've found, that was a prevailing understanding um, of, of that story. I hope that that answers <laughs> that. Um, if Radio Free Mormon, if I missed something, you can clarify if you want to. Um, but an important part of that story, though, too, um, is that in the book of Genesis, there is no city of Enoch if the Enoch that we're talking about is the seventh from Adam through Seth's line. But no Zion? I guess there isn't, is there? Well, there isn't. Yeah, there's no city of Enoch in that way. <laughs> but the very first city, um, according to the book of Genesis, is a city called Enoch that's built by Cain. <laughs> and he names it after his son isn't it <laughs> so the, the first city is the city of enoch and so that's one that i've never really teased out that it huh. there's something going on there um that yeah. i don't really get maybe you know maybe smith didn't like that you know the first city civilization comes out of cain's line what he's supposed to be a wanderer he's supposed yeah, to be yeah. um, Maybe I'll help you do that study. That is yeah. intriguing. That yeah. could be fun to look into. Yeah. And so that's another interesting little part um, of that. That, um, Yeah. In, in fact, kind of segueing into that, mm -hmm. uh, 
Vanderkam, Enoch, yeah. a man for all generations, when he's noting the, uh, and this is just on the in the opening of his book, just briefly, the uh, the Akkadian sources for the chapter five. I mean, it's obvious that the creation story, the Tohu Vavohu, has uh, Sumerian Mesopotamian sources for the actual creation myth. And and then he is indicating, and Vanderkam is one of the better Dead Sea Scroll scholars. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he he is. Know like 20 flipping languages. I mean, the man's yeah. an animal. Yeah. Uh, and he describes how when the Enuma Elish was found in the various tablets of some of the Mesopotamian stories mm-hmm. of Napishtim, who was the Babylonian Noah, and with the king's list, with the 10 kings, the seventh king that correspond there there's 10 generations who lived extra long in the genesis record enoch is the seventh and right. the seventh is mn duranki and mn duranki and enoch have a lot of parallels like they both walked with god and they were both and so th- this theme of a of a uh, a borrowing, and yet the story is a prevalent story throughout the ancient Near East, is powerful even from an ancient point of view, and we are now discovering more and more and more of those sources, which helps us grasp that we have a bigger thing here than just parallels to Joseph Smith, mm-hmm. is how I would put it. So. Yeah. There you go. Radio Free Mormon is saying thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Kane or Bigfoot? Oh, this is bringing in Spencer W. Kimball. <laughs> He's a dead prophet. We can't listen to anything he said. Don't you remember what Russell M. Nelson said? <laughs> Living prophet only. <laughs> hey, we're going to give a plug to Radio Free Mormon, too. Thanks for your time and efforts. and con- Yeah, I loved your show the other night. And the week before that, the week before that, the week before. Yeah, we could go on forever with him. <laughs> so um, now, are you are you familiar with the uh, scholarship of Andre Orloff? Yeah, I haven't yeah. read, a, you know, at length um, his stuff, but he comes up all the time in, you know, um, Enoch studies. Yeah. That is no surprise. Andre Orloff is yeah. one of the great. Yeah. Actually, didn't he come from across the ocean, didn't he? He's not from here, from the United States. I, I think he's originally from Russia um, or somewhere um, over there. And yeah, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know um, what his whole story is, but yeah. Um, he does a lot of fabulous research with the old Slavonic Enoch texts. Exactly. Yep. Really His text, Enoch Metatron was fun because of the etymological analysis of uh, Metatron. Well, and the name Enoch, as far as that goes. And and I just did a <laughs> a podcast with my good friend Trevor, where we're talking about the hermetic aspects of some of Joseph Smith's mystery thinking mm-hmm. and uh, the connection with the Egyptian Thoth and Hermes in the Greek. Well, Hermes and Enoch are connected they're mm-hmm. actually both messengers from you know and it goes yeah. Yeah. Salt, and he comes back and sure so that's the that's one of the main themes yeah well then you know enoch was important to joseph smith not just for what we're, we're talking about but um in one of the early revelations I, I always forget the number of this one but um early revelations for the doctrine doctrine and covenants there was a revelation about um one of the organizations that they were setting up and one of the companies or something like that. Um, and Chris Smith has written on this. I should be able to remember this better. Um, but they used pseudonyms for each of the different uh, people that were involved. And Joseph Smith's pseudonym was Enoch. Enoch, yeah. He he also had a pseudonym Barak Ale mm-hmm. as well. So yeah. so that it wasn't wasn't hard set fast. But yeah, yeah, he yeah. put put Enoch on himself. Yeah, right. and Barak Ale, and uh, that had something to do with the. Uh, not, not the ale you drink, but Barak ale had something to do with lightning, and mm-hmm. uh, you look in the Hebrew and you can do the etymology, but had something to do with. Anyway, it was a cool code, but uh-huh. yeah, he always seemed to. Uh, it is remarkably interesting how uh, interested uh, Smith was with the patriarchs, with Adam, yeah. yep. Enoch, and Noah, Abraham. and Melchizedek. 
Abraham. <laughs> get Abraham. I've never heard of that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would, been, that would have been cool to have also had a book of Noah or something else, you know, from, from him. But yeah. <laughs> there's actually a Dead Sea Scroll Noah fragment in yeah. there. Yeah, there's there there are fragments of so many different things. But yeah, I mean, even in the the book of Enoch, I think it's like the last three chapters are like a little book of Noah. So yeah. Oh, that yeah, I think that is. That was when they were describing his birth and he was mm -hmm. glowing. Yeah. Uh, his dad thought that his wife had an affair with the uh -huh. with the watcher. Wasn't it the watch? I think it was the watchers, and she uh -huh. swore, Oh no, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating stuff. The idea yeah. of the glowing, the glowing babies. I I didn't glow, darn it. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I glow now when I get under a bright light. That'll yeah. work. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, hey, let me let me. It came and it went. I had another, I had another question. Are oh, are you are you familiar with Gabriel Boccacini? Yeah, Boccacini. Yeah, Boccacini. I, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. No, Beyond, no. yeah. isn't he advocating uh, an Enochian group? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yep. What do you think of his research? I think I think he's great. He's one of the the. I mean, he might even be the uh, leaders of the the Enoch Seminar. It's an international consortium of scholars that all study Enoch literature. Um, oh, and, have fun to go to. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they 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 go different places. A lot of the times it's in Italy, um, and hang out at some really you know amazing places, and then spend a week uh, presenting papers and talking together. And it's it's more than a conference because they actually sit down and talk through the arguments um, um, and, you know, spend a lot of time developing their ideas. Oh, that would be rock and awesome. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Now I wouldn't be able to contribute a thing except for sitting there looking at them with goo goo eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Same. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. right. Okay. Uh, we do have a question and I do want to, uh... Oh yeah. Heather, thank you. Uh, can you give a plug for Colby's published works? Colby, here's where you get a brag. Where can yeah. we read? essays books to note etc yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah ahead sure. where um, we can I, have, I, will, I will second i will second endorse him anything the man has written so yeah. <laughs> you're too kind yeah <laughs> um i have pretty much everything up on my academia um page so academia.edu like carrie uh, mentioned before um and so, yeah, you can go on there. Um, I think all of my essays and all my book reviews um, are on there. Um, and if, if you wanted to make sure that, it, you know, you didn't miss anything, I always update my CV. So my CV is on my academia um, web, web page. So if you go on there, you can click um, CV. It's just up at the top. Um, there we go. And, We've got the running banner for you. Is oh, there you go. Correct. Academia.ed. Yep. You look up Colby Townsend. Yep, that's it. Yeah. yeah, they're all there and it's worth doing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the only thing that wouldn't, I mean, that I know for sure isn't there is the, the recent collection of essays that I edited for signature books. Um, so yeah, that one, um, signature prices it at cost. So they don't make any money on it. I don't make any money on it. It's 1895 for the paperback, um, but you get 10 essays um, and a short introduction from me. Um, just to sort of, sort of describing, um, you know, the importance of the essays and why I brought them together. Yeah, so. That's a great prize. Um, let me also just put in a plug too, uh, so that it will help encourage um, my audience for looking up your materials. Um, I did not realize this until just a week or so ago. Several of Co of uh, Colby's materials are in Dialogue, A Journal of Mormon Thought, mm -hmm. and all of those are online and available. Yeah, they're you free. Yeah. yeah, you can look them up for free, and they're fabulous. Thank Colby you. stuff. I mean, all of dialogue. Oh, funny. yeah, yeah. But Colby has put some really good discussions in there, so you'll look that up on dialogue as well. Yeah, and that's it. all you do is download the PDF. So yeah, I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I have some things in the Journal of Mormon History um, as well. Yeah. Um, a shorter essay on the question of translation um, with Joseph Smith. Um, and yeah, you've got a review of uh, the Joseph Smith papers also mm -hmm. on your academia. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Colby has reviewed several different mm -hmm. uh, 
kinds of books from multitudinous authors, both Mormon and non-Mormon. I have found every one of his book reviews to be an absolute delight. And they're really not long and pedantic, you guys. I mean, I actually kind of sort of chided him the other day on the phone that he writes too short <laughs> <laughs> Of book reviews yeah. in, in a very friendly manner, of course. Yeah, yeah. And then I had to let you know that I'm not allowed to write longer. <laughs> that's how, yeah. that's how yeah. I, book reviews are. They're, Once they're you get to PhD hood, yeah. Yeah. Well, even then, yeah, the, the, the journals that have, you know, word limits on book reviews, on articles, everything. Um, so, yeah. 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 Any, any other questions, you guys? Oh, well, Mosia, yeah, there goes my weekend. I, I'm with you there. I, I'm spending my weekend with uh, Colby. That's that's absolutely my pure delight. So, okay, you guys got that academia. All right, I hope, I hope. Any other questions, you guys? Um, now's your chance to learn anything about Joseph Smith's environment with Enoch. Oh, hey, I do have a question. This is the question I was going to ask you. Have you run across anything about the... Uh, Mahija episode. That is the oh, one yeah. where Nibley makes a huge amount of hay about because it virtually is inaccessible, and yet Joseph Smith got it. Uh -huh. Matthew Black hid the manuscript from him because he did not want to confirm Joseph Smith. Now, that's how Nibley left it as an impression, I have never heard any updates. Do you have anything on that? that you yeah, that's actually in one of my published essays as well. Um, I, I have a whole. Which one? Uh, textual criticism. So it's, it's um, what's the, that's the subtitle. Going, going back to the sources. What is it called? Um, I haven't read, but I'm going to. Now okay, I'm just, so oh, dang, I the name of my, my own essay. Yeah, returning to the sources. That's what it's called. Returning to the sources. It's uh, my essay in the Inter Intermountain West Journal of Religious Studies um, no. from 2019. Um, yeah, in that one, I talk about a handful of different um, things that are, are in, in important to, to, to understand um, as far as like textual criticism in Mormon studies goes. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, I point out in that essay that Mahuja not only was accessible, it was in Genesis. Excuse me? It's in Genesis. It's in Genesis 5. It's Mahuja L. But the name is right there. <laughs> like, no, not only was it accessible, it's just in the same chapter. Um, not, not with the lions roaring in the wilderness, though, is it? Not that part, no. Um, I, I don't remember the if Mahuja I had much to say on in that. Genesis. Colby, you're blowing my mind. Yeah, it's just right there in the same chapter that he's revising. Oh, hold on. I'm going to go to the source. i got to find my Bible. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, really, no offense, but no, no. I'm going to have to look this one yeah, up. Yeah, go for it. You, you keep talking and explaining. I'm going to go find yeah. my Bible. Last two um, oh, there it is. So, yeah, not, not only was it, you know, accessible, it's in the chapter that he's actually revising to create, um, the, you know, the Enoch material. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not, to me, <laughs> it's not really, you know, that surprising. Um, well, not at all now. Be there, yeah. You're shocking me. This is very interesting to to hear. You, you say it is Genesis five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find real quick book of the generations of Adam. Yeah, I'll find this really quick. Um, and I could I could maybe even like just briefly read. Kind of Mahalel, Mahalel. I'm in fifteen. Jared, Jared, many daughters. Mahalel. Oh, is that it? Mahalalil. Mahal. Oh. Um, no. That's part of that's. Um, Okay, so it's Genesis 4.18. Oh, okay, 4.18. So sorry, I said it was Genesis 4.18. Oh, it sure is. Dude, you're blowing my mind. Wow. So, Unto um, Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methusael, mm -hmm. and Methusael begat Lamech. No way. Yeah. Me, oh, wow. Yep. <laughs> so sorry. Um, well, no, I'm very grateful I asked you that question. Yeah. And I have to, I have a whole section in that essay about um, Mahuja and Mahuja L. And I mean, it's actually a longer section than I thought. Um, 
And yeah, I, I talk about Nibley's final installment in a strange thing in the land series. Um, yeah. He always ended up with that because it was such a fabulous PowerPoint for him. Yeah. And yeah, about his work on Mahija and Mahuja. Um, and I actually argue in the paper that um, I think that Mahija is an accidental misreading of Emma's handwriting. Um, I actually think that it is Mahuja um, in the manuscript. Um, oh, interesting. So, yeah, I go over that and then um, basically say at the end, um, let's see, in any case, the idea that if Smith intended the two separate names, Mahija and Mahuja, that he would need to be dependent on an ancient manuscript or source is also unlikely. In his commentary on the Bible, Adam Clark, whose commentary was known to Smith while he was uh, while he worked on his revision of the Bible, created a table he called same names differing in Hebrew. And the first examples he shared were from Genesis 4.18, Mahuja L and Mahija L. It was possible, contrary to recent opinion, that Smith and his contemporaries were aware of the spelling difference of the name found in Genesis 4. English speaking Americans living in New York during the early national period had access to important scholarships such as Clark's, which requires that scholars uh, consider the broader literary texts available at the time and their relationship to the Mormon canon. So yeah, I do engage that. Um, it's 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 in there. And yeah, 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 that whole thing. I mean, it's another just kind of an awkward moment where, you know, I had read Nibley's work uh, on the topic and I'm sitting there, you know, working through, I, I've been working on a critical edition of the Book of Moses for a, a while. Um, and I'm working actually on an official um, uh, project now with two other editors on a uh, critical edition of Mormon texts. Um, but you know, I, as I was reading that, I was you know transcribing multiple manuscripts of the same text over and over and over, and I was like, yeah, Mahuja's right here, <laughs> Mahuja L, you know. Um, so, I mean, I I even I I hate to admit that I've actually read that in Hebrew and never caught it. I, I've got my Hebrew mm -hmm. Bibliotheca Stugartensian, mm -hmm. and and then I've got another one that's a an interlinear by Kolumber, and it's wonderful how he's made the interlinear work so well. But mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've read the entire, I've read all the way up and through Isaiah in Hebrew years ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't remember. That's wow. This is wonderful. Yeah. That was worth, that was worth having you on for that last five minutes. <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed the whole hour and a half so far, oh. hour and 15 minutes. And we need to go for another six hours. So start asking questions, you guys. <laughs> no. <laughs> We, we wouldn't put that up to you. Okay, so uh, let's see. That was the, my main one that I wanted to... Oh, let me ask your opinion on this now. I know, and again, forgive me, I, I, my my basis is, is from Nibley, mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to get it into an apologetic argument. Yeah. Not no. at all. No. But he did make a big deal. And, and I do believe uh, Nicholsburg and Vanderkam have also, because it really is genuinely in the Enoch texts, where one of the things that made the God so mad, and I, I still to this day don't quite get it, is when the women were uh, so caught up with cosmetics. I mean, Mary Kay in antiquity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were doing the eyeshadow and the perfumes. Uh -huh. and, you know, Isaiah talks about their tinkling yeah. bells and coffers. And why, why would that have been such a such a an enormous negative? Is it because mm -hmm. it's being their vanity, or they didn't want the women to be beautiful, so that they would go out and be harlots, or what? Why is that such a big deal in the Book of Enoch? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think it's the same problem as it is in, in Isaiah. I'd have to look at that specific question, but so if I'm just sort of you know spitballing an answer, I think I think it is just all about vanity. I think it's all about like, well, you're you know spending all this money and doing all these things just you know for looking good, rather than actually taking care of the poor, rather than actually you know doing all of the other um, you know mitzvah, the, the the commandments, the mitzvot, um, the commandments. Um, so yeah, I that's how I would understand that. Um, but yeah. Um, I don't know. And, you know, the, 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 the book of Enoch is before um, the, the Qumran community. Although I, I, I think the book of Chini has something there that, you know, um, that the Qumran community are heavily influenced by the Enochic literature and that we're, it's probably better to understand them that way rather than Essenes. Because Essene is just such a difficult 
you know, who, who, <laughs> who were, who were Essenes and like, like there were different communities and were, yeah. you know, were, was, was the Qumran community really the same one that was in, you know, it's, it's a complicated mess that, you know, he, he tries to sort of work through in that book and, um, yeah. Excellent yeah. observation. I, I, I've just been studying uh, and reading, actual, actually watching a lot of his YouTube videos also, uh, James D. Tabor. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to be utilizing some of his materials in my up and coming this coming year, because now that I found out the church is going to be studying the New Testament, I also want to study the New Testament online for my audience. But with this caveat, mm -hmm. I, uh, I wish to present, and, and I would love to have you help me do some of these. This would be a ball. I would love to present the Sunday school, the Sunday school class that I wish I had had, right? Mm -hmm. go, go a little more depth into the, the on the ground, the dirt, the archaeology, and the textual history, mm -hmm. and the actual culture, rather than attempting to stamp rather than worrying and focusing and emphasizing on a doctrinal issue in modern Mormonism and trying to make it look like the Bible also had that doctrine, that seems to me to be the direction the church usually will take with the, especially in the New Testament. <laughs> and I want to try to just bring out more of the what is the book saying? What, what were the Jews doing back then? Why were they acting the way they were? Yeah. Type of thing. Have you seen the, um, it's, it's edited by um, Mark Tzvi Brettler and Amy Jill Levine, um, the Jewish annotated New Testament? No, you're just about to cost me some money, aren't you? About $40. Yep. <laughs> oh, well, not bad. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you might be able to get a, a used. There goes my lunches for a month and a half. Right. Yeah, there's a second edition that came out a few years ago and definitely recommend that one. It has some extra stuff in it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank I would you. recommend that if you're going to do that. Um, and if you really, you know, want a good. I am. Um, I'm right. doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm committed. I'm going to do it. Yeah. yeah. I may not get all the way to the New Testament, but that's not the point. I, I oh. just want to, I want to try to. You know, as an apologist, it really began to bother me after a while. What happened was I discovered the biblical scholarship. And mm -hmm. then I went back to the fair guys and I said, you know, this should be us. How, how come they're doing all the good work? It, it's Mormon scholars' names. It's us. that We should be writing this stuff. Mm -hmm. This, this, mm -hmm. that's the book Nibley should have wrote. Uh -huh. that's, the, that's the book the apologists can still write. Why aren't we doing this? And so that's what I want to do with my through through a video because mm -hmm. I can make slides and all. And, and now I have access to excellent scholars like yourself. I can have consult. Mm -hmm. help out. <laughs> yep. So fun stuff. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Hold on. Someone's putting. Oh, Heather. Yes. Revisiting Joseph Smith. Yes, that's it, Heather. And the availability of the Book of Enoch, Colby Townsend 2020 dialogue. Yes. Yeah, that's the one. And, and that should be free. It is. Yeah. So you can get that from dialogue. That's how I found it. Yep. And it's an awesome read. You'll love it. Yeah, very good, very good. Oh, and look, I've got Mo, Mo C is saying that's a great idea. Well, that's what we're gonna do. So okay, any other questions, you guys? We are we are getting close to the time. We're gonna wrap it up. I'll give you one more minute to ask a very excellent scholar soon to be phd within a month well i mean time is relative right <laughs> <laughs> that's what einstein said i'm just saying uh -huh, right so, so really do you think you're five years out colby are you on the front? Uh, i mean it depends i'm working on two so um you oh, know uh, I've, I've always been told that that adds about a year um oh so, yeah, okay. yeah the, the way that the two work here is that you do coursework for both you do exams for both, and then the dissertation um, is a combined um, thing with the two departments. So, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, what you're saying? You just recently uh, completed your master's. Well, um, sort of. So, I I completed the what I really consider my master's work. Um, uh, was in 2019 from 2017 to 2019 that was at USU and here they require a master's in English um, and so you know as I took classes there were like it's like a milestone master's if you've ever if you've ever heard that term 
I took stuff to, that, that works toward my PhD. Uh, but once I hit a certain milestone, it was like, congratulations, here's your master's. So right, right, right. Yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't any different than just doing my PhD work. It was just in the system. I was an MA student and then it switched and there was literally no difference in anything. Um, it's just a you know, bureaucratic thing. So yeah. bureaucracy, you got to love it. We can't get away from it anywhere in the world. So yeah. we yeah. just deal with it best we can. So, OK. Oh, hey, hey, here we go. Here is another question, if you don't mind. Heather Reddick, thank you again. Colby, can you explain the excerpt at the end of the essay, Camilla Stark, A Spell for the Sick and Afflicted? I didn't put that there. I think that's a thing that dialogue does. I'm going to hurry and pull that up um, to see what that is. Because, um, yeah, that's not from me. I guess I could pull it up too, huh? Let's see. Is that on the last page? Oh, it is. It probably mm -hmm. is. And therefore, yeah, it's some artwork. Advertisement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. There you yeah. go. Um, it's just some artwork. They, they do these really interesting things. I love it. Um, I don't have the current issue right here with me either. But um, yeah, dialogue um, just does you know, uh, artwork throughout um, each um, issue. And so, yeah, to be honest, I hadn't really looked at that one. I think technically that's supposed to be connected to the next essay i think it, it goes like on the left hand uh, side of the page of oh, the, that's how the, they oh yeah 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 put um, it all over. yeah but yeah i don't know sorry <laughs> I, I i don't really know much about that all right uh, i've got another friend from my good friend noel hausler any thoughts on the book of abraham uh you, just tell us, tell, us, tell us about your book of Abraham review, because I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times. Why don't you go ahead and give us about five or six minutes of comment on your review of the book, what you thought of it and all that. That'd be fun. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I'm, yeah, I've, I've, I've actually reviewed, like you said, quite a few um, issues of the volumes of the Joseph Smith papers. And I just yes, submitted a book review uh, for the journal of Mormon history for the original manuscript volume. And that one, that one's actually more fun. Um, to yeah. Make. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I thought it was a, I thought it was great. Um, I thought that I, I think that that's a really important um, issue uh, volume, I should say. Um, and um, the, 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 the problems that sort of came out after that, particularly the, you know, animosity directed at Brian Hauglid were really disappointing um, to see, you know, to me. Um, because I think that it's a fantastic um, volume, and um, you know, knowing Brian Hauglid and and Robin Jensen both, um, they're fantastic scholars. The work that they do is so important. Um, they are. So, yeah. No, I uh, pretty straightforward. You know, comments and review. I don't think I said a whole lot in that um, review, other than you know here. Uh, here's what's in it. Um, I think it's I really remember it was very positive. Um, you know. Yeah. I don't remember a whole lot um, coming up from that. There might, I, I usually try to make some sort of overall point um, or, you know, something, sure. something like that, but sure. um, yeah, no, but uh, to, to, to uh, sort of respond to Noel. Um, yeah, yeah. I have, I have thoughts on the book of Abraham. There's some, they're kind of preliminary thoughts. Um, one area I can't say anything because I'm working on an essay with a friend. Um, he made a discovery that's really important. I think um, on the book of Abraham and, we're actually working through it right now. <laughs> um, yeah, looking so, forward to it. Yeah. Let us know when you get it posted. Yeah. No. yeah. And hopefully that will be a short essay with um, the Journal of Mormon History. No, put the details in. Well, this one, this one's a buildup. So this is a little oh. thing. Um, and uh, the Journal of Mormon History um, added a section where they'll they'll actually do short essays of like two to four thousand words. Oh. Um, so this one, this is this this one's actually perfect for that. And um, he and I are planning on. Um, doing some other things um, in the future. But this one will sort of lock that idea in. You know, people will be aware of that, have that, and then we can go on to do other things. So, yeah. All right. Cool, cool. Uh, I wanted to just show you, uh, you know, you know, the regular volume mm -hmm. things of, of several of the Joseph Smith papers, right? Yeah. Well, for my edition of the Book of Abraham, I'll just show you the spine. Whoa. Yeah, compared to the regular, that is because in my edition, <clears throat> that's it. I have <laughs> added absolutely every oh. article, graphic, mm -hmm. concept, all of my own notes into the book itself so okay. that 
if I ever have a discussion about the book of Abraham, all I have to do is grab one volume. See, yeah. there's, there's, there's the book right there on all of this other extra stuff is all of my notes taped in wow. and reference to the book on the facsimiles, the different hieroglyphics for the king's name in facsimile three, uh -huh. the hypocephalus stuff. And I've got all my crap right there. So. Wow. Yeah. So that's actually the original binding, but you broke. The yeah, yes. And taped yes. It. What I did was I cut it <laughs> down the middle. Okay. And then I duct taped, I, right. I added everything. Then I right. duct taped it all together. Wow. See, yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> this is all my additional stuff. There's like 350. That is about as thick as the, yeah. the, the, <laughs> the book. So this thing's like seven inches wide. So I've got sure. all my resources right there. So yeah, I, yeah. Wow. I, I did not job that way. But yeah. if I ever have a discussion with it, all I have to do is grab one book. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, fun stuff. That's what you call overkill preparing. So <laughs> that's the way we do it. Yeah, we got to scan that in and put it online. Be, oh, boy, that would take at least a week. Oh, <laughs> or is that 70 weeks like Daniel talked to? Was it Daniel who did the 70 weeks or was that Enoch? Or was uh, it Daniel no. who did the 70? I, I think it was Daniel. Yeah. Now, Mark Walker actually had a discussion on that in, in one of her books mm -hmm. with the great high priest or something like that. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. You guys, thank you so much for attending this special session. Um, I, I know we made it at noon today instead of normally in the evening because we've got some more work we're going to do behind the scenes for your benefits in time. You'll just have to be patient with us, but uh I do want to thank <laughs> Backyard Abraham. Yeah, all right, knock it off. You. <laughs> You're way overdoing it. I do so want to thank you, Colby, for, for being a guest on my show. And yeah, well, I am you. looking for many, many, looking forward to many more times when you get a new article published or when mm -hmm. you get your PhD. I want to have you on for a congratulatory show or whatever, you know. We mm -hmm. can throw cake at the screen, and, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> jazz so uh -huh. all right if you guys don't have uh yes it did elder igloo your presentation did make it there in that book of abraham yeah i, I did a mormon stories podcast with john delin and gerardo gerardo actually came to my house and took photographs of all of my stuff that i was going to use as slides mm -hmm. and he helped me make the slides and elder igloo bless his heart sent me a bunch of his research and slides mm -hmm. and gave me permission to use them. So credit to you, Elder Igloo. Yeah. So, but yes, that's in that book. I guarantee it. I did not leave that out. No way. So, okay. You guys, um, we're gonna, we're gonna call it a day for now for you guys. Um, Christmas is Sunday. I, I'm not convinced my wife's even going to let, I think I'll take the day off and uh, maybe I'll come back on a Monday evening or something, but uh, I think I'll skip Sunday. Don't, don't count me out Christmas Eve though. You never know. I sometimes come up with surprises. I am also producing now, uh, as you well know, I hope you do. If you don't, I will let you know right now. I am just actually recording videos. Uh, YouTube has come up with this idea of YouTube shorts I'm not doing that. I probably need to, and I'll find out a way to learn how to do that. But I am also doing shorter videos between a half an hour, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. And I call it the backyard professor responds where I respond to videos kind of like Daniel McClellan is doing on TikTok. Daniel is a good friend of mine. I've actually interviewed him when I was with fair, uh, I've got a video of him and I together somewhere way back when I'd like to get him back on the show. He's a TikTok superstar now, but he talks about biblical exegesis. I'm kind of imitating his approach with videos. I've been responding to some of the church videos. I've been responding to the book of Abraham videos. I will be responding to biblical videos on and on and on. So just to let you know, we are constantly trying to give you new formats, new layouts. We're trying to bring in good scholars like Colby here. And uh, Dr. James Harrell has, or Charlie Harrell has agreed. He will come back on. Dan Vogel is going to be here in January. I will have Radio Free Mormon again in January for our second 
analysis of David Bednar. Uh, Richard Carrier has agreed to come back on with me and I will be doing Boy, everybody wants to keep coming back, and I am so grateful for that. It's glorious. It's wonderful. I enjoy it. So, all right, we're going to head out, you guys. We love you all. Thank you for attending. Uh, we will be back with more exciting times as we can. And in the meantime, remember, do well, have fun, stay happy, be good, make friends, don't stay up too late. If you do stay up too late, have fun and get eight hours of sleep. I don't care how old you are. The day's coming where eight hours will be the best thing you've ever done for yourselves.